I, I was thinking about what the, what we might what we hope subject we might look at what a bit of scripture and I I just started believing you know we've never looked at the incommunicable attributes of God and those are attributes that he can't communicate to us like well he, he can communicate to us love and goodness and holiness and justice and honesty but what he can't communicate to us are things like self-existence self-sufficiency eternality or omnipresence and so i thought well tonight we would look maybe at at the eternality of god and one thing i found when i was looking at this subject this last week was that it was both a pleasure and a comfort even if it is uh, at the same time mind-boggling and, and mind-stretching and one thing i noticed is that all of these incommunicable attributes of god and follow a thing called the doctrine of aseity, and that's A-S-E-I-T-Y, which is existence originating from and having no source other than itself, which could be applied to all these attributes and especially the eternality of God. So over the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to look at God's eternity, I hope. And uh, I hope you'll come to agree with me that eternity is one of the most beautiful aspects of the God that we worship. Because without a God who possesses an eternal nature, we would be forced to live our lives in fear and a sort of nominal despair. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are his everlasting arms. So let me read Psalm 90. I'm going to base my talk this evening loosely on Psalm 90. I think you have it there in your, in your uh, program. Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight, are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and it withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath, we bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet the span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Well, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, the eternity of God is a theme that runs really through the entire Bible. In fact, all our biblical doctrines and truths would collapse without the reality of an everlasting God. Paul speaks in Romans 1.20 of the, his eternal power and divine nature. Ephesians 3.11 speaks of his eternal purposes. 1 Timothy 1.17, Paul calls him the immortal king of the ages. Genesis 21.33, Moses says, he is the everlasting God. Psalm 100 says, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. And as we just read in Psalm 90, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. 
And you know, if you were to write down all the doctrines that you embrace or all the themes that you love from the Bible, and then say to yourself, you know, I don't think I really believe in an eternal God, then you would end up with really absolutely nothing. Because eternity is like the adhesive that holds together every truth in Scripture. And although the concept of eternity is, well, beyond our imagination, it is still a truth that should give us comfort in every generation because it is a source of awe and worship. It's even a source of stability. And there are three things that I want to look at this evening with regard to the eternal God. And that is, firstly, God is the God without beginning. And secondly, he is the God without end. And thirdly, he is the God who does not experience succession of events. So as we think about the fact that God has no beginning, think about the first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. This we have God telling us about the beginning of the universe and its history. And if we want to understand our world, the meaning of life, our origins, our destiny, and so on, well, we can find them in Genesis. But those opening words offer up an immediate question. And thankfully, they also provide an immediate answer. Because the big idea is there, in the beginning. So what's the question? In the beginning, what was before? What was there in the beginning? What was before the beginning? And the answer is, in the beginning, God. So in the very first verse of the Bible, it claims that there is a single being, God, who was there before the beginning and who is the force in creation and the source of all things. And the sentence also implies that if there is a beginning, then there must be something that follows on, something afterwards, something that we might call the future. But then again, there's all that time between the beginning and wherever the future is now that is just ongoing activity. And the Bible goes on to say that since God was there at the beginning, then it was he who designed and created the beginning. He gave it its life, its purpose, its direction, and he even ordained its end. Psalm 90 verse 2, Paul, Moses confirms this. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And we also see in those opening verses of Genesis that God is not a part of his creation. He is separate from creation. There is the creator, and then there is his creation. And the point is, everything in creation is finite. It is not everlasting or eternal, but God is and what I mean by that is that God is not bound in any sense by limitations of space and time. Space and time are part of the created universe. So in respect of time, we speak of God being everlasting or eternal. And with respect to space, we speak of God as being omnipresent or everywhere at once. Now, at some point, we may look at the omnipresent God at a later date. So I just thought tonight I want to relate a short thought about eternity or eternality in relation to time and what that actually means. It's something that Isaiah speaks a lot about. He writes in chapter 40, Have you not known, have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He doesn't faint. He does not grow weary. In other words, he never changes. He is the eternal, everlasting God. Have you ever noticed in the doxology from Jude, verse 25, you may recognize it. I've used it here to end First Wednesday on many occasions. And it ends by saying, To God our Savior, who alone is wise, the <laughs> glory, majesty, dominion, and power, before all time, and now, and forevermore. See, that phrase, before all time, and now, and forever, underlines the assertion that God is everlasting, although his creation is not. So what does that really mean for us in practice? Well, in the first place, I think it's important to say that God accommodates us, his creatures, as he talks to us. He uses tools like language and the Bible because there's no way that we can understand God as he is in himself. I mean, no one understands, for instance, the concept of infinity or eternity. And 
Well, if you think you do, think about it like this. An average galaxy contains between 100 billion and 100, and 100 trillion stars, which for you mathematically minded people is between 10 to the 11th power and 10 to the 12th power. And astronomers estimate that there are approximately somewhere between 100 billion and 100 trillion galaxies in the universe. So how many stars are there in the universe? Well, somewhere between one sextillion and 10 sextillion stars in the universe. That's somewhere between 10 to the power of 22 and 10 to the power of 24. So now, do you understand that number? I mean, of course, of course you do. No one does. But it's a big number, isn't it? It's actually a very, very, very big number. And even after we've heard it explained and we can define it as, say, 10 to the power of 22, we still can't grasp it. We still can't understand it. And so think about this. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the earth. Now, I have researched this, and this is not just some urban legend. This is apparently true. But just think about that. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the earth. And again, can I understand that? No, I can't. But realize this. Eternity is even bigger. And even as the number of grains of sand may increase or decrease or, or the stars, even if we added them together, the grains of sand and all the stars, eventually we are dealing with a finite number while eternity is infinite. And because we can't really understand this, when the Bible says that God is eternal or God is everlasting or that he is before all time, now and forever, it's actually using language with a view to help us. It's not trying to assert something that you would put in a systematic theology, but instead it's asserting something that under, underpins a sort of pastoral theology. I mean, these assertions actually minister to us. Psalm 90 tells us that people die. They are swept away in a sleep of death, but God exists from everlasting to everlasting, which means God is above the realm of death. He's in charge of the universe, and he controls it from a position that is over and above death and decay. And that's what we find, that he is involved with the creation, but he is exalted above it, which means he has ability to act without constraint. His response to his creation is limited only by his own counsel. And when you and I pray to this God, I think we should acknowledge that he is a God, and he has no limits placed on him by anything in creation. And this speaks to us in a pastoral way. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And the help he gives me, no one else can give me. And the fact that he helps us shows us that he is invested in us. In the beginning, God means there is a personal source that has created all things and determined their meaning and their direction. So, so let me just ask you this. Do, do you know this God? Because you see, if he is the eternal God without beginning, creator of the universe, then there is nothing more important than you and I are in relationship with him. You see, the purpose of your life, whatever you think it is, is actually determined by him. So we should offer ourselves in service and praise and worship. Now, secondly, not only does the Bible reveal that God is without beginning, but it also reveals that God is without end. The eternal God, God without beginning, God without end. Psalm 9, verse 7, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. Revelation 10, 5, the very last book of the Bible, the apostle John writes, and the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, he who created the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and what is in it. 
And that's really the Bible's message to us, that the Lord endures forever. God without beginning, God without end. And I think it should come as no surprise to us, surprise to us that the almighty God is without end. I mean, why do things end generally? Well, things end because of rot or decay. Maybe there's some sort of defect in them or obsolescence or destruction or threat. But you see, none of these things can be the case when it comes to God. There is no inherent or latent weakness in God. Stephen Charnock writes, He cannot be overpowered by anything else. A stronger than him, there cannot be. Nor can he be outwitted or circumvented because of his infinite wisdom. As he received his being from no one, so he cannot be deprived of his being by anyone. As he necessarily exists, he necessarily always will exist. And Revelation 1 verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, God Almighty. Now, since God can have no end, time is not a problem for him. And there is a fundamental difference. This is a fundamental difference between us and God. I mean, because we are clock watchers, really, aren't we? We often stress about how much time there is or how much time there isn't. There are people who worry, for example, that they're running out of time to have children. Others worry that or they're stressed because their children are growing up too fast or not fast enough. There are people who like to be early. There are people who are always late. But in some way or another, we are always watching the clock on a daily basis. But you see, God has all the time in the world, or actually, in fact, he's got more time than all the time in the world. He has eternity, which actually means he will outlast every problem that anyone might ever conceive because he has no end. And if we just think about Abraham for a moment, you'll remember that he was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Now, Isaac was the basis of the fulfillment for all of God's promises to Abraham. But there were still things to come, promises that were yet to be fulfilled. For example, it would be 400 years before the promised land would come to Abraham's people. And it, it's also an ongoing process even now that Abraham would become the father of many nations. And Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham died without all the things he was hoping for being received. It says he died in faith, not having received the things promised. And that's very much like us, isn't it? We will probably die without seeing everything that has been promised to us actually received. But you see, Abraham's response to this situation is an example for all of us. And it's a message in it. It says, Abraham called on the name of the everlasting God. You see, we all face challenges and obstacles. And they stand between us and our cherished hopes. And death will come to us before all these hopes are fulfilled. But you see, God endures forever. And the Bible tells us that our hope is to be placed in him. So when you place your trust in the Lord Jesus, you're entrusting yourself to him who has no end. And for that reason, he will not, he, he cannot fail. He is the God without end. So the eternal God has no beginning and he has no end. And that brings us to our third point that God does not experience succession of time and events. He doesn't experience in his nature and his being the succession of events in the same sense of time. I mean, in other words, I couldn't think of another way to put this, but God lives in a sort of eternal present. See, time began in Genesis 1.1. Time began with creation. Therefore, whatever time is, God made it. And time is a mode that belongs to the creation. And as we've noted, God the creator is other than the creation. He possesses his being outside of time. While we are, as human beings, governed by the linear progression of events. 
I mean, that's why we watch our clocks. And there's so many movies, a lot of movies like uh, Back to the Future, Terminator, X-Men. Well, they're all about time travel. But at the same time, they all attest to the fact that we are time bound. And in reality, we live one second after the other, one minute after the next. Everything is a sequence of events in the frame of time. But God doesn't exist and he doesn't experience his existence in a succession of moments. Mike Ovey, one of my former teachers, once asked us to imagine a person's life like sitting in a boat being taken down the river by the current. We, we can't see what's around the bends. And when we get there and make the bend, much of it is a surprise. And we can see what's behind us, but it soon fades from memory as it disappears from sight. But at the same time, imagine God looking down from above, looking down like he's got a map spread out on the coffee table. He looks down, he not only sees the whole river, but he also sees the land and the terrain surrounding the river all at once. Now, I know that when it comes to God and his eternity, there is no analogy that holds up completely. But the point is, I think we do know that for us, it's one second after another, one minute after the next. It's our life is a sequence. It's a progression of events. And God doesn't experience his existence as a succession of moments. And I think one way we can understand that is that time means constant change. In fact, time is, or change is the hallmark of God's creatures. I mean, I've gotten to the age now when I go to bed at night, I wonder which part of me is going to ache in the morning when I get up. Or try finding a picture of yourself 10 or 20 years ago and put it up on the mirror while you shave or put your makeup on and then try to convince yourself that you're not changing. You see, time means that constant change is the hallmark of God's creatures. And in the same way, I'm sure that we've all gone to bed some nights praying that we might improve some aspect of our lives the following day or in the following days. I mean, for example, have you ever prayed for a greater faith? Have you ever prayed that you might be a better parent or friend or servant to the church? Well, amen if you have, because those are wonderful, fantastic things to pray for. But at the same time, those are prayers to change. As Stephen Charnock writes, the being of creatures is successive, but the being of God is permanent. And it remains entire with all its perfections, the same in an eternal duration. You see, God is the eternal being. And he's not in the process of becoming or developing or improving or decaying. The God who lives above knows the beginning and he knows the end. And it all exists by his eternal decree. He sees it all at once, just as if the whole thing was sitting in the palm of his hand. And if this thought does nothing else for us, I think it should give us some focus about, about how we live our lives. And if we just think about sin for just a few moments, the psalmist in Psalm 103 tells us that God will not remember our sins and that he will separate them from us as far as the east is from the west. And I'm sure this will not surprise any of you, but there are sins in my past that I committed a long time ago that I haven't really thought about for a long, long time. I mean, they were forgiven many, many years ago. But they are and will remain eternally present before the mind of God. Psalm 90 verse 8 tells us that our secret sins are on view in the light of his presence. Anselm wrote that men and women fail to grasp the exceeding gravity of their sin. And with regard to past sins, you know, we may think, what's the big deal? They happened a long time ago. A lot of water's gone under the bridge. Well, the big deal is this. My sin is always present in the mind of God. And that should be, I think, a sobering thought. But here's the good news. Our salvation in Christ is also eternally present in the mind of God. We are converted in time. You are justified through faith in Christ in time at the moment of believing. 
And in the mind of God, who knows no succession of time, you are in Christ eternally, outside of time, eternally. You see, our salvation is eternally present to God because it originated in his own will. Our salvation originated in God's own eternal will. Therefore, the sacrifice of his son, the Lord Jesus, on our behalf is also eternally present to the knowledge of God. So as we stand before the one who is eternal, he sees everything. It's all laid bare. My sins are there, fully exposed, fully presented at all times. But so is the blood of the Lord Jesus, which covers them. And how precious it is. His eternity also means that the final judgment of the wicked is also eternally present to God. That's why he can be so patient as he waits for people to repent because he knows the day of judgment and the destruction of the wicked is an eternal certainty. It's, it will come. Moses says in not, verse 4 of Psalm 90 that in God's sight, a thousand years is like yesterday. And it's Peter who tells us in the New Testament not to mistake the time spent waiting for the Lord's return as God being slow to keep his promises. Because as the eternal God stands outside of time, Peter says a day to him is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And that points us to a, a further implication that we've already referred to, which is God remains the same throughout eternity. If God is eternal and perfect and existing outside of time, then it stands to reason. I mean, how could he change? What, what could he change into? Especially if his eternal perfection is already unsurpassable. I mean, we look at all the qualities of God and how wonderful they are, especially the communicable ones, the, his holiness, his godliness, his justice, his truth, his love. And, and they all are eternally so which means they will never alter or decay or change. Every human source of trust is bound to fail, but God himself will never fail. He is perfect and he is eternally the same, which is wrapped up in his own self revelation to Moses. I am that I am. The eternal God is by definition, the unchanging God. He is unchanging in his will. He is unchanging in his purpose. And he can never deceive us in the expectations of his promises. He never falls short, but he does often go immeasurably beyond what he has led us to expect. His counsel will stand. He will do all his pleasure because he is the eternal God. But now, at the same time, in the eternality of God, it is the great hope for the believer. But it also holds the greatest terror for those who reject the creator, for those who would deny him their worship and obedience and faith. And just think about that for a moment. I mean, what a terror the eternity of God is for the unbeliever and the rebellious. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a blatant rebellion or a passive rejection, but it means the dire threats of God's impending judgment upon them will come to pass. And those punishments will be eternal. A life spent rejecting God and his will, the Bible says, is certain to end in judgment in the lake of fire. So listen, if you are an unbeliever here this evening, let me urge you to cry out to the eternal God for mercy and faith. Faith that you might repent of your unbelief. You see, the etern eternality of God, in fact, is a, a real strong plea to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Since God is everlasting, it means that all his promises of judgment, both temporal and eternal, will certainly come to pass unless one repents and places their faith in the eternal Son, Jesus. And just think about the three points of God's eternal existence we've talked about. God without beginning, God without end, God without succession of events in his experience. See, if that is who God is, then our faith in his word is well-placed. Our faith in his word is, is sound. Because all that is promised and all that is declared is certain to be true and fulfilled. 
You see, you and I make promises not knowing what is to come. And we make promises with sincere intentions, but beneath it all, we know that we can't really ensure anything. We can't really promise anything. But God inhabits eternity, which means he knows the end of everything. And he brings everything to fulfillment and completion by his infallible decree. See, God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should change his mind. That's why Jesus can promise, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle or iota or dot will pass from the law until everything is accomplished. So, as we ponder our eternal God, I think we should look around and understand that we are living in a world and in an age that will soon end. Therefore, if our God is the eternal God, we should seek to become eternally minded people. We need to look toward God and toward our eternal future with him and not be so focused on this all too brief and temporary life. Psalm 90, Moses extols the eternal God who is from everlasting to everlasting. And then later in that Psalm, he, he draws a contrast between God's eternal life and the finite life of his creatures. You have their program there. Verse 10, he says, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may receive a heart of wisdom. And what Moses means by a heart of wisdom is a heart that knows that life is short and eternity is long. We're all going to die unless the Lord returns and it is the life after death that really matters. That's the lesson that the eternity of God teaches us. And it should motivate us to give our wholehearted attention in this life to the life to come. You remember Jesus prayed, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means God's glory should be our preoccupation in this life. His kingdom and his gospel should be our focus because all the earthly empires, businesses, governments, sporting dynasties, they're all going to eventually fall down and turn to dust. But when we come to worship, as we are here tonight, or in the raising of our children to read the Bible and to pray, or, or when we speak to a neighbor or someone else about the Lord Jesus, these things are, these, these investments, they will last forever and ever because they are everlasting in God's economy. And we need to develop the, an eternal perspective because as creatures bound for eternity, which is our destiny, the matter of salvation versus condemnation is the issue above every other issue. In John's first letter, he wrote, do not love the world or the things in the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You know, when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins, which are eternally present in the mind of God, are also eternally covered in the mind of God by the blood of the everlasting Son. And then, in, in the atonement of our sins, we are forgiven. And as Paul says in Romans 8, we become heirs with the Son, the Christ of the eternal glory. We are heirs with him. And because the Son lives forever as our reigning high priest, the Bible tells us that he is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through him. Which means that because our salvation is rooted in eternity past, we are secured in eternity for all the ages to come. And because God is never ending, he will forgive me then as he has forgiven me now through the cross of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we bless you, we honor you, we exalt you. We ask that in the weakness of our faith, by your grace, 
that you would pick us up and teach us to number our days so that we might receive hearts of wisdom, hearts that enable us to see you and to trust you, to revel in you and to hope in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.